All right. So I'm sitting here with uh, Erica Santuccio, who is, by the way, my fiance. Thanks for coming in, coming to have a chat. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> So, Erica, I've told you I've been interested in asking questions related to work, and so I'm setting this show up to be kind of a survey of people that work in different industries and do different kinds of things that they call work, and asking about the specifics of that, trying to extract maybe general ideas that may come out of this conversation, may come out of a series of conversations, but this is all part of a uh, let's say field research in developing a philosophy of work for me and for those that are listening and hopefully for those that are engaging in the conversation. So thanks for being here. Um, if you would, I, I guess to open up, um, I'll tell you what, why don't you tell me, well, let's start here. Let's start with your parents. And why don't you tell me about growing up, what you knew them to do at, for work and, or what, yeah, what your first memories of work are, your introduction to work, and maybe what your parents do uh, and consider work. Um, so my mom is a hairdresser, and when I was younger, she started out full time, but then she had an injury that um, on her left hand that made her go part time. So when my dad um, built the house with his friends in New Hampshire, he they originally had a two car garage. And in the plan, I don't know what part of the plan this happened, but they converted one of the garages to my mom's salon. So she's always been home. Um, and she, it was great for me because she would come over and check on me. I'd be in the house and she'd be like, okay, I got to go back to work. And she'd bring a cup of coffee over to one of the customers or whatever. And I quickly realized with her that, yes, she's a hairdresser, but a lot of what she does is super emotional. So it's, I guess, a feature of that type of work that people speak freely and there's a lot of vulnerability and a lot of just freedom to be who they are. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's not a salon that has other hairdressers in it. It's just my mom. And um, I quickly realized that she had become a little bit of a social worker friend type thing um, while doing her actual work, which is with her hands, but her hands had become less able. So she still pursued that. That's her passion is cutting hair and she's always done that. Um, but she was able to quickly be bivocational to me. And I really respected that in her because she would come and check on me and she would either be happy or sad or she'd tell me a quick story about a customer and she'd debrief with me a little bit and then 30 minutes later there'd be another customer and she'd go in and then come back out and check on me and I'd be doing probably the same thing, watching TV, eating all the food that she made or whatever. Um, but I, I, I learned very easy or very early on, I guess, that what I thought was an easy job for her was incredibly difficult and it took a lot of work. Um, because it was highly relational. So on the relational, emotional side. Yeah. 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 So she, I don't know what I expected a hairdresser to do. I mean, she does exactly what I expected. Um, but I didn't realize what kind of work that turns into. Mm -hmm. um, and ironically, my father's father was a barber. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So she has a lot of the memorabilia from his, um, That's awesome. his shop. Yeah. Um, so... She does that. She still does it part-time. She'll probably do it as long as she's able. Um, and then my dad, his full-time job is, see, this is where <laughs> it's evolved over time. I know that he currently manages different campuses for a large hospital network up in New Hampshire, the hospital I was born in. Mm -hmm. So he's been in the engineering department. He's been part of construction. He's done a lot of different things. He calls himself a jack-of-all-trades, which... We laugh at, but it's not far from the truth. He's yeah. pretty able-bodied, and he's very capable and smart. Um, and then his passion, I would say, is being a fireman. And he mm -hmm. became a fireman. Um, I don't remember how old I was. I want to say I was four or five was when I, when I remembered him tying knots for fire school. He was and, Sorry, but he's done that up until just recently. Just recently, yeah. About, I would say maybe... A year ago, six months ago, he retired as captain. So he's still on the board. Um, he's still a part of the brotherhood, yep. um, brother and sisterhood now. There's a couple women on the department. Um, 
So I, I had a couple days where I went into work with him um, at the hospital, but that was always super scary for me. And he, it was such a big place, and I didn't know much about it. And the bring your bring your kid to work day yeah. was always super stressful. Um, so for I, you, for me, <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> um, but the work that I remember him doing is all the work he did after that job, which was um, all the service work that came with being on the fire department. Um, I remember watching him speak at like selectmen's meetings and they would record it because it's a small town. And me and my mom would sit there with bated breath, just waiting to see what Dave would say to the town. And he was very um, determined to make things fair. He was, it still is very focused on justice and equality. And I saw that early on and it, he always was pretty passionate. So there was a lot of emotion that came behind a lot of stuff he said, but I could tell that there was something inside of him that had purpose. And, um, I quickly latched onto that and so did my mom. So I guess when, when the man of the house in the kind of format to which I grew up, When he decides to become a first responder, then the family also kind of has to consent to that as a lifestyle. And I didn't have a choice because I was younger and I shouldn't have a choice in my parents' um, vocation, but I'm so grateful that he chose to do that. And um, it kind of gave us a family outside of our nuclear family. And my mom was able to then because she, we live in a town called Brookline, New Hampshire, and she's the Brookline haircrafter. So my dad was captain of the fire department. My mom's the Brookline haircrafter. And what ended up happening is a lot of the people in town started coming to her and relationships were built and there was overlap. So like she would cut the lieutenant's hair and then the lieutenant's wife would come in and get her hair cut and then their kids would come in. And it's just, it was a cool network that built out of having a business in town and then being committed to the people in town. Yeah. And it was just, such, it was a very cool way to grow up. And I'm very grateful for both of their vocations and how they use their personalities. Now, you said that when the man of the house or your father became, chose to be a first responder, and it affects the whole family or the whole family needs yep. to kind of get on board with that. Yep. What, how do you, what, what did that mean? Like, flesh that out a little bit. Like, what did that look like for the family? Um, it was cool for me in a lot of ways because I'm an only child. So hmm. we spent a lot of time at the fire station and mm-hmm. the generation, my generation of fire kids, we were all about the same age. Um, and there was a good amount of us, probably 10. And I think that I didn't understand what he did fully until I got older. And there's a scanner in the house. So like we're always it's always going off and all of us are, I mean, it's, there's, I, I believe there's actually two scanners. One is in their bedroom and it one did is sound in the, like it was from every direction. It, yeah. Well, it's all, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to miss for obvious reasons. Um, but as I got older, I started to listen to the addresses like my parents did. Um, and you start to get a little nervous. Like you hear a chimney fire and then all of a sudden, Oh wait, that's, that's a kid in my class. I know yeah. that house. And that started happening when I was in middle school. Um, And I don't know at what point my dad became the Jaws of Life guy. Um, I don't know if he was the only guy, but that was one of his specialties. And so he responded to a lot of accidents. And that started to create a little bit of fear in me, I think. And being from New England, um, our power went out a lot. So we'd have a lot of like, severe storms and I started to realize that every time there was a severe storm or lightning or something like that my dad would get a call and he would leave so what ended up happening is my dad is responding to another call and we don't have any power it's just me and my mom and it became clear to me that if things got really bad he could potentially not be there because he was responding to something else Mm -hmm. So I had a, I have a handful of memories of us losing power and then immediately the beeper going off and my dad leaving to go to the fire station. And, um, it, 
I w- I've always been so proud of him. And it's been such a cool thing to watch him be a part of and watch my mom be a part of it. Um, but it those midnight calls and the early morning calls, I remember one time he had a fire call on Christmas morning and I had to sit and look at the wrapped presents because <laughs> my mom was like, you cannot open these until your dad gets back. Right. And in my head, he came back at four o'clock in the afternoon. My mom says he came back at like eight thirty in the yeah, morning. Yeah, he's gone ten minutes. Yeah, <laughs> but like it was an eternity to me, and um, and I'm naturally very anxious, fearful. Um, so being a child of a first responder was difficult for me when it came to emotions. Um, but overall, I was just I've always been so proud of him. Yeah, I hear the uh, fear and nervousness in, in, you know, from take your child to work day to, yeah. you, know, wa- you know, dad's not going to be here. And of course, being as close to you as I am, I'm, I'm familiar with that <laughs> yeah. reality. What is your first memory personally of work? Um, the So when I was younger, they don't do this as much now, but they used to do communal breakfasts. Breakfasts? Yes. Um, <laughs> and the... Who's they? The fire department. Okay. So they would throw a big breakfast. Um, I believe, uh, I forget the price. It was minimal um, or it was appropriate. Sure. And they they use it as fundraisers or Mm. just various things if they needed stuff. Um, I was young when this happened, so I don't know what the financial plan was. But I remember being very, very little. And back in the day, I had hair like Shirley Temple, so I had little ringlets. And... um, they would cook the breakfast, and then usually the kids or the teenagers would serve the breakfast, like serve the tables to the guests, which were the people in town. And I remember being very young and taking one of the f- empty boots, one of the fire boots, and walking around and saying, if, if you'd like to contribute to the fire department, like here's, here's the tip jar, put, put a dollar in the boot. And um, people got a kick out of that. I think because I was so small and because I looked like Shirley Temple, so... I may have not done a good job at that, but I was, I was, yeah, I was aesthetically, yeah, yeah, the right person. And, but I, that was my first memory of going in and out of tables Mm. and being intentional with people and looking them in the face, asking them what they needed. Um, I would clear the tables. I'd bring them butter, random things they wanted. Um, so my first experience of work was like being a waitress now and I was in elementary school. I want to jump off of that memory and we'll come back to these early years, but why don't you go ahead and introduce what it is that you do for a career? Yeah. So I am a student nutrition manager at an elementary school, um, which just basically means I manage the kitchen Uh and there's over 250 schools in this district. So it's a big operation. Um, It's pretty standard that there's one manager at each site. Um, and I do all the procurement, all the staffing and basically all of the things that happen outside of food I have to do. And then there's a, um, we have a production coordinator that's with us. That's like an assistant manager and they, they're out on the floor with the employees and we do breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And there's about 900 kids that go there and 99% of them get free lunch. So it's. Wow. It's a big program. How old are the kids? Uh, Pre-K through fifth grade. Pre-K through fifth grade. So elementary school. Yeah. And so from that beginning story to what you're doing today, has food been a theme in your life? Yeah. There has never been a doubt in my mind regarding vocation. I've had doubts in every other aspect. Um, no, so since I was little, um, I remember getting one of those plastic kitchens. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, like, yeah. Obsessed with it. Yeah. I to- <laughs> like, totally obsessed egg. with it. Yeah. And my dad absolutely loves and breathes food. Like he would wake up in the morning and we'd be sitting around having breakfast and then he'd be like, All right, what do y'all want for dinner? Well, we wouldn't say y'all. What would you guys want for dinner? And it was just like food was on the forefront of his mind constantly. Um, And I noticed that it was something he used to manage anxiety and stress. He seemed like he really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed doing that with him, right? Uh, My mom was a baker primarily. Mm. So 
I learned a lot about measurements and paying attention with her. And she's naturally a little more patient than him. So I always really enjoyed being in the kitchen with her. Um, and I enjoyed being in the kitchen with my father, but it was a little bit more, there were higher expectations and he was particular and things like that. So I became a lot like him in that way, I think, just by modeling their behaviors. Um, but, yeah, I remember getting the kitchen. I was probably four or five and thought I was going to own a restaurant since I was little. Um, there was no doubt. And then when I was in high school, I tried to pursue, like, a, I don't know what you call it, like an elective at another site where I would do culinary arts, but... I didn't feel like doing it. it was too much work. So <laughs> I did normal high school. Uh, I tried a semester of that, and it was, I was just not into it. The um, culinary. Yeah. I wasn't into doing extra things. <laughs> so what I ended up doing is I applied to Johnson & Wales and UNH, got into both, and just decided to go to UNH for food service management. So hmm. it's I have an associate's, and it's a two-part degree, so it's front of the house and back of the house. So we learned management. We learned about nutrition. We learned about the science behind food. And then we learned how to run a business um, and how to manage employees and stuff like that. You used the word vocation that you said you were never had any really question around that and that it would involve food in some capacity, you probably own a restaurant or something like that, or run a restaurant. Now mm -hmm. you're running a cafeteria. Yep. Um, so are you familiar with the... Um, that term vocation and it's kind of origin or no. etymology. So, well, it, it comes from the same word. Like we use like voice, right? Like, so it's kind of from the Latin and I, I don't expect me to pronounce Latin, but like to call mm -hmm. uh, vocatio or something like that. So like it, it, it to, to call, it is a calling. So vocation has like a deep meaning and, and I think we use it correctly, but often without thinking a lot about the, that early, Meaning now with saying that, I don't know, does that bring up anything in your mind? Like, does that add anything when you start thinking of that in terms of like a calling? Was it something you, you said, I knew that at a very early age, I've stuck with that my whole life. Just, I don't know. Does that add anything and thinking about it that way? Yeah. I mean, all of my memories of food and childhood are positive. And I remember f like having a visceral, re visceral reaction to being a part of that with my parents. So like my dad cooks a three day, um, sauce and a red sauce for pasta and meatballs, stuff like that. And there was a process to that. And he included me in that process and he'd be like, okay, you got to make sure you stir it. You got to stir the bottom and then we're going to put it in the snow overnight. And then, in the snow. yep. And the, or out on the porch cause it'd be freezing. And then he'd the next day we'd bring it back in and put huh. it back on the stove top and it would sit there all day, low and slow. And I was just so intrigued by that. And I just remember always loving food and getting excited. And I remember like being in first grade or kindergarten and I wasn't able or allowed to use the stove yet. So I used the microwave and I made my famous egg sandwich, which I literally put an egg in a bowl, microwaved it and then put it with a, uh, English muffins. And I was like, and why is it famous? Cause I said it was, <laughs> <laughs> um, I only served my parents it or whatever, but we still, we still refer to it as the famous egg sandwich. Nice. But I remember it, that was like my own recipe creation, creation. Yeah. Right. And I knocked on their bedroom door and I delivered it for the first time and they tried it and they went mm, or whatever. Like, I don't know if it was actually good, but they pretended like it was good. good. And it, did something to me. I just, it felt right. Huh. And now granted that was my parents. So I felt comfortable like experimenting with them and it was simple. It was very little, but it was just so cool to make them something, bring it, watch them eat it and then have them smile and say, thank you. That was great. Yeah. Unpack that. Maybe have, has that experience, of course that's with your parents. Like you said, has that been echoed with other people in your experience of creating food and serving people? Because that seems to be kind of at the heart of this vocation, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that stems from kind of the mandate that my parents created in our lives that we serve people. So mm. we did a lot of that to begin with. Like we, if somebody got sick, we would prepare something, put in a Tupperware and bring it over. Um, 
it was just, it was clearly the love language that my parents operated out of and that very well could have influenced me more than I understand, right? Mm-hmm. But it felt like it was inside of me. Yeah. And I'm sh- I mean, there's tons of studies about nature and nurture and there probably was something inside of me and then it was nurtured, right? Yeah. And then I was guided through it. So I think I've always associated the two. So And it okay. seems I've I've always felt that when I was in the jobs that I was it, I've had various jobs, but they've all typically been around food. All um, of them? All, every single one of them, yeah. Really? Yeah, when I was in high school, I um, worked at a fruit farm, which uh, I was in the actual fruit stand. Mm-hmm. And um, fruit being, like, including tomatoes. This guy was very into his tomatoes. He had a ton of heirloom tomatoes. Um, and there were Jamaicans that came for three quarters of the year, and I got to know them. And... They it, came when it was warm? Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. And then when... To work the farm. Yeah, to work the farm. And then when it got too cold, the family picked up and went back to Jamaica with them. And mm. I thought that was killer. So like... Good situation. Yeah. The business owners had built a family around the people that work for them. And that was my first experience of that. And I remember thinking, that seems good. That seems right. Like there is no distinction like I can tell okay this clearly is the guy who owns the farm but this clearly is the guy who runs the farm right yep. and they're brothers like there's no doubt in my mind and I remember thinking like this is what work is supposed to be like and I was very proud to work at that place um how long did you work there four years yeah all of high school um and right before that I also worked at a maple barn um and that technically was my first paid job. I was a busser and I rolled silverware and stuff like that. And I scooped up maple syrup off, off the table. Um, <laughs> and that there was less relational. Um, it, it was very clear that the front of the house was a family and the back of the house was a family. And that's very typical of restaurants. Mm-hmm. Um, they will intertwine a little bit. Um, and sometimes in not so great ways. Right. So I loved that job because I learned what it was like to be in a public space. Um, but for some reason working at the farm stand, um, I learned the value of like having your employees be part of your family. Yeah. Um, and it was very clear that the farm owners often served all of the men. Um, they would cook for them and make sure they're House had everything it needed, and like they were servants of their servants, and I thought that it was like a constant revolving relationship where one wasn't serving the other more than yeah. the other one was, or whatever. So, um, and then my first experience on the, as being a line cook uh, was at a steak joint up in Massachusetts, New Hampshire area. And I was the only female in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So that was a completely different experience. Um, I learned a lot. It was highly stressful. And I felt pretty alone because I was the only female. And I quickly realized that it can be a very dangerous environment to be a female um, in a kitchen full of men, especially if there's a language barrier. Um, A lot of those men were from Brazil, so they spoke Portuguese and broken English. Um, So... I, throughout all of my different jobs, I've worked in every area of food service and I've seen the positive and the negatives. Like I was a baker's assistant also, um, at this place in Nashua. It was a, called Frederick's Pastries. Um, so I've done pastry. I've done front of the house. I've done back of the house. I've done selling the food. Is there a story about getting a job at that pastry place that was that a job you weren't supposed to be able to get or something? Yeah, I remember my parents remember this better than I do. All I remember is being incredibly persistent and slightly demanding. Mm -hmm. So and that is like very, very out of character for me. I'm not meek, but I do get nervous. Yeah. And unless I'm angry, I'm pretty articulate when I'm angry. Um, I can be very impolite, but generally speaking, I, if I have to speak about myself, 
especially in any sort of like positive manner, like in a resume format, I'm pretty nervous. Yeah. But for whatever reason, yeah, going to this place, my parents said, like, you decided you were going to get the job and that was it. And apparently yeah. I got it. And I was a baker's assistant. Okay. So. Now, as you talk through all these, we're kind of running through jobs that you've had. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the, one of the things that stands out to me in conversations like this and is, I think, a part of our kind of cultural understanding of work is we often affiliate work with what we do for a paycheck. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that you're aware of like work kind of even serving neighbors, like you mentioned, with your family doing and things that you did that were like maybe not, um, let's say, professional or, or like an employment situation. Um, and maybe just thinking back, let's go back to your childhood even, and just think through like what, yeah, like er, an early memory or even just like, I don't know, let's say not professional type work, like your understanding of work, just, uh, I don't know, broaden this a little bit beyond maybe the scope of jobs. What do, you, what do you mean? <laughs> well, have you ever done work that you weren't paid for? All the time. Okay. Have you ever, uh, like, w yeah, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to help broaden the scope of the word work here. Mm -hmm. So to say like, well, what do you mean by that? What, and I don't mean like, yeah, I should have been paid. Like if you went and served a neighbor and you helped like, I don't know, let's say you have a neighbor in need and you were going to like do their landscaping or take care of their yard or whatever, like you would work at that, right? Mm -hmm. That would be work, but it wouldn't be work like we're talking about when I say, tell me about work and we talk about jobs. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm trying to divorce those. Yep. So now I'm just asking you about work that isn't jobs. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, for me, the majority of my thoughts are emotional. Um, but if, the, if I'm not sure that makes sense. Most of my thoughts are feelings. Are feelings, yeah. So most of, most my, of thoughts, my feelings are thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and. Do some CBT. It, yeah. <laughs> it. It's very clear to me that when it feels right and good that I associate it with work. So I, uh, let me, yeah, let me rephrase that. So there are times that I haven't gotten paid many times where I have done a task for somebody and s somewhere in that interaction or that transaction, it feels right. Like even if the work actually sucked, like if it was, mowing five acres, right? That would suck. But if the reason you did it was like, oh, this person needed this task done, mm. no one else could do it. Um, and, and you hopefully have a pre-existing relationship with the person you served, something happens at the end of that where you go, oh, that was good. Yeah. And even if you're tired, it's like a different kind of tired, right? Um, you just feel satisfied, I mm. guess. Um, and I've also done a lot of work that doesn't feel satisfying. Um, but that typically has been associated with a paycheck. Yeah, that's interesting because I think that's true of a lot of people. They say I go to work and I do work for a paycheck and mm -hmm. I hate every minute of it to get this paycheck so I can go live my life. Right. And, and I think you're putting your finger on something like purpose. Like if I have a sense of purpose in a thing, right? And so... Yeah, I'm curious, like that distinction there. So maybe flesh out more, maybe some examples of things that you've done that felt full of purpose. Um, yeah, and even right. to contrast that with jobs that maybe didn't. Well, I mean, we currently have the free market with the well over at Waters Ave. and Can you just say a word about that so that, you know, folks that don't know what that is? Yeah, so, I mean, it's been many different forms right over the years um so it its current form is a it's set up like a like a shop basically like a grocery store and when the drop-in center closed from for the well um a new relationship was built with waters ave and there's been a lot of different rooms available so i know that one of them were like oh we should do a free market and so we set up a bunch of shelves 
there's a cooler in there, there's a couple freezers, and we've continued to do the same pickups that were happening with the drop-in center. So we st- still have those same relationships with those companies and stores and stuff like that. And a guy that's a part of the community picks them up, brings all the food over to the market. And then we are currently doing mobile and, I guess, stationary. Uh, <laughs> mobile and not mobile. Mobile and not mobile. Um, every Monday, people can come in and shop for free and grab anything they need for their families or themselves. Um, they weigh out and then it goes to a spreadsheet and we're able to track all the food that's going out and all the people we serve. And um, currently it's every Saturday and a different team goes out to a different location and takes that same food. We just set up a account with Feeding America. So we're going to be purchasing food for super reasonable price. Um, try- yeah. So Feeding America tells us it's not a purchase. It's a shared expense. It's a shared expense. We're sharing in the expenses of getting okay. this food here. Yeah. That's, okay. It's gas money. Gas money. Yeah. Which it is cheap enough to con- can kind of consider gas yeah, money. Yeah. No, it's a great relationship to have in... It's to me, it's it's a little nerve wracking because it's a little more formal. Right. It is. So like we as the well, like I've been a part of the well in the past and now I'm currently involved. And it's always been like not bootleg, but like you do what you need we to say do. Organic. Organic. Okay. Grassroots. Grassroots. Um, you do what you need to do with the resources you have. We'll right. Make it happen. And that has always been what's happened. So it's. It's interesting to now be a part of something official, right? Super grateful. It's been awesome. We're doing a second. Our second pickup is next Monday. Yep. It's amazing to have all this food and people, all of our guests have loved getting it. Um, so yeah, that's the free market. And I spend this significant amount of time trying to organize it and make it better than it was yesterday and do. Um, make sure everybody is on the same page with communication and what we want and I do like the basic maintenance of making sure it's up to code in there. Mm-hmm. And I kind of going off a of serve safe. Like I just be, by default became the person who is, well, you're the one that is familiar with these things. Yeah. I'm the has, one that's certified yeah. in it. So yeah, it's been amazing to see it evolve over time. And I, I want to say, I think it was a year or so ago, maybe two years ago, I visited a community up in Philly um, and there's a bunch of men and women up there who've kind of devoted their lives to Jesus and serve out of that. And they kind of pursue a Franciscan lifestyle. Um, And there was one brother who just, it's so captivating, like who he is as a person, but he did a lot of what people would consider dirty work, like taking the trash out, sweeping, picking up spills, cleaning out the equipment. Um, and he never complained. And he always had a smile on his face. And people were always thanking him and hugging him. And just everything about him was so beautiful. And I remember taking a picture of him taking the trash out. And it was like negative 10 degrees. And he was wrapping all the trash bags and doing what he would do on any other day. And I thought... I need to keep that aspect of food in my life. Like I need to continuously be taking the trash out and cleaning and just reflecting on what it means to serve. And it's not always like pretty and everything looks good. Um, Sometimes the food's rotten. I got to throw a bunch of rotten food out. Um, But I just, it was important for me to take a picture of him and I look at it often. And I think that's a, a specific type of work that, isn't always fun, but it seems right. And I am hesitant to give that task to somebody else. And it's literally, I just go in once a week on Thursday and I clean out the pantry and I make sure everything is back in order for the new load to come in. But it's dirty and it sucks and it smells and it's super hot in Florida and I'm dragging food back and forth to the dumpster. But I always think of him and I think that this is good work. Yeah. So this is really interesting. Um, he seems to be like an important icon that you, and Mm -hmm. even the picture you took, I imagine you having hung up somewhere (laughs) would be like a point of reflection, but you think about him in the midst of doing this Mm -hmm. behind the scene, hard work that you're saying is good work. Yep. 
Um, why, what can you try to unpack that? Why do you think this so touched you to see? And why do you think it's so meaningful to you? It seems to be um, an underlying belief in the food service industry. And I remember the first job I had on the line uh, was at T-Bones in New Hampshire. And the guy who owned it was a part owner, I believe. He gave me my first tour of the kitchen. And he's like, here's a dishwasher. Here's the fry guy. Here's the guy, you know, wrapping all the meat. And as he was talking, he's just walking me through. And all of a sudden he stops and he grabs a bucket and he puts a sandy towel in there and then he takes a piece of cardboard from the recycle spot, puts it on the floor, lays down on his back and starts scrubbing underneath the, um, the salad station, still talking to me. And he's like, Hey, you know, it's important. Like as you walk around, like if there's anything that needs to be done, just do it. Right. And I was like, wow, you're the part owner. Like you're just on, you're on your back scrubbing. And then on our way out, he went over to the disc, dish guy and that kid was about 17 18 and he was sweating and he was smelly his whites were like completely covered in ketchup and all this stuff and that guy turned to me and said this is the most important person in the kitchen don't forget that Hmm. and it goes without saying that a kitchen cannot operate that is serving the public without a dishwasher right so and it that stuck with me because and it was even more powerful to me because I had just watched him clean, right? So I had watched him flesh out his own belief, right? So he's like, I believe that things need to be done. I believe that things need to be clean and clean. Like, this isn't just, oh, let's have fun and cook food. He's like, there's like back-breaking work. And the people who do that day in and day out are the backbone of the place. And don't forget it. This, this guy in, was it Philly that, uh, this is the Franciscan Inn that you're talking about. No, that's T-Bones. So no, I'm sorry. I'm trying. Yes. The story before that. Yeah. Yeah. This guy you snapped a picture of, right? So yeah, this is one of the brother, brothers. Yeah. Brother Fred. Yeah. So brother Fred, um, is a, is a, he's a, um, he's a friar. Yep. And so that is a, he has a spiritual conviction he's a Mm -hmm. christian calling and a vocation as a friar so and then you see the way that he fleshes that out i'm just curious because you you kind of tell two stories and one's a manager in a kitchen uh, or part owner part owner and and then one is a friar yep um and you see something like a similar ethos or spirit in them but i'm curious if you think there's if you want to like i don't know let's say what can we name the spirit behind that? Or can you say like, what is the, do you think there's something in the friar that is related to his, like is how much this is related to his life of faith? And then like, I don't know, compare and contrast that with this owner manager that is teaching you a similar lesson in a different space. That's a restaurateur rather than a friar. Right. Yeah. When I was at the inn, um, it was clear that there wasn't like a hierarchy. Now, obviously there was, right? So there's people who had different roles. Um, but it, it seemed as though they were always trying to be equal and to just be a family. And like that included the guests, it included the public. Like there was no hierarchy. Um, and I think that is a similar thing in restaurants because there is naturally a hierarchy like the prep cook is not going to get paid the same as the saute guy right um and they're like naturally that happens in various businesses but um a good restaurant will have family meal and everybody contributes to the meal like depending on what station you're assigned and then you all eat together Mm -hmm. and they did similar things at the inn so And then just watching this guy, the part owner, based on his behavior and his actions, I would say, he seems like a Christian. Yeah. Very well couldn't have been. Like, he didn't, he doesn't have to be a Christian to serve like that, but it definitely has an overlap. Hmm. Um, And the restaurants that I have liked the least 
aren't relational. And there's clear that the, the head chef is the head chef. And that, I mean, that is the culture. Like you should be super respectful. And it's, if the chef's name is Dan, you don't call him Dan, you call him chef. Right. Yeah. (laughs) So like, and that, that goes the same for what I saw in the community up in Philly. Like if you're brother Fred, then you're brother Fred. If you're father Michael, then you're father Michael. Like, Mm -hmm. so there's an awareness that, people have different roles and different tasks, but, um, the businesses that look most like a soup kitchen (laughs) seem to do the best, um, when it comes to just relationship and goal setting and keeping people together. And I know that like restaurants often have like a revolving door because they're low, they can be low wages. It can be a lot of time on your feet but if you feel a part of a community if you feel like you're part of a family you're less likely to leave right um and families don't put their weakest link out on the porch and then have dinner like it yeah well can i ask you about that so okay so i have an experience um that i i don't know so the idea of work and community and family and you've brought that up in several of your stories so Mm -hmm. i think that's kind of a core theme here um so when we ran the drop-in center, when the well ran the drop-in center, we had, so we had a space that was open six days a week for folks that lived on the streets, a uh, big family room for people to come. I know, I know you're familiar mm-hmm. with it. I'm just sharing for yep. the sake of, yeah. yeah. Um, people could come in. We did have a free market set up there. We had a shower. We had some gardens where folks that didn't have work and food could work together to grow food. We raised a bunch of tilapia in that space. We were raising chickens. We, that was the origin of the bike shop that we run today. Well, about bikes, there was a, what we called the recycle bin, a couple of shipping containers full of bikes and tools people could go out and work on. And there was a lot of things that went on there. And so we welcomed in maybe, I mean, it got to where it was like 200 neighbors a day that folks that were on the streets or let's say precariously housed in the neighborhood that needed a place to be, get out of the sun. Um, One of the things in Tampa, you get run all over the place if you live on the streets because it's basically illegal to be homeless. And so you can never stop moving. So this was a space where if you're inside, we said you can be here People can rest, get off their feet, be in the AC, drink some coffee, just be a human being, build relationships. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of it, the heart of what we were doing. Well, what would happen over time is people would come in and they, you know, I immediately think of like a specific person, but uh, many, many people would come in and say, man, I so appreciate this space and this family here. It's clearly a community of people loving and serving their neighbors, just doing exactly that. And I want to contribute. You know, and I don't have any money, but I have all this time on my hands and I'm able bodied. And so, you know, let me take the trash out. Let me help with preparing lunch. Let me help in the kitchen Mm -hmm. and let me help. I'll clean the showers when everyone's done. That wasn't the job most people raise their hands for, by the way. Right. Uh, But but yeah, people would jump in and want to help out. And many people would do some of the like hardest, craziest things. You know, Mm -hmm. you just see uh, this one guy, James, we had all this land and he would he would just go spend all day out there weeding and weed eating and just doing all this like landscaping work, just back breaking work, moving big bags and logs around. And I remember some days it would start raining and it was like, he wasn't even aware that that the weather changed. He Mm -hmm. would just still be out there working anyway. So this will start happening. And we considered that like we functionally were family. And so we threw, we had family dinners Mm -hmm. like once a week we gather, but we also invited a bunch of neighbors in and we had this thing going on and we used the language of family. And it was really, I think important for folks that were so alienated and isolated, especially people that are homeless and feel hated and unwanted. They come into this place filled with hospitality and grace. And they say, there's family here. There's relational connection. And, And we started to form that now over time, what comes with that same population was a lot of mental illness, a lot of addiction, a lot of personal problems. There's a lot of people that end up on the streets for various, various reasons for all these different things. Some beyond their own control, some things that were their own fault, you know, and a lot of times you find people that are not good with family, not good at relationship that have relational issues. And so one of the things that I remember reflecting on, and I actually remember having a conversation with some of the core staff and team that were there is I think we made a mistake to use the language of family um, because there's some people here that need removed. Like we need to actually 
like, so, so, and I tell all, I say all that to bring you back to this moment for me, but then to ask you in a place of running a restaurant, running a team, running a family, mm -hmm. um, as a manager, as an owner, as a leader, whatever, there are times where, and so we had a sign hanging up in the old place. Actually, it's hanging up right up there. I can think I can read it from here. It says, if, if this is from the rule of St. Benedict, um, it's kind of a re reworking of it. If any visitor comes from any place and wishes as a guest to work and rest with us, sorry, I can barely see that far, and is willing to abide peacefully by our customs, they shall be received into this community for as long as they desire. If such a person finds fault with anything we do or exposes it reasonably and with love and humility, we shall discuss it prudently, lest by chance God has sent them there to teach us this very thing. But if a person cannot learn to be peaceful during their time here, not only shall they not be accepted within this community, but also it shall be said to them by all of us that they must depart. And if they do not go, let two stout brothers, which is the name, would be a great name for a pub, let two stout brothers in the name of God explain it to them and escort them out of this place. And I think, so we ended up hanging that and it became a centerpiece for this exact conversation because mm -hmm. we're like, you can't ask me to leave, I'm family. And when I thought about that, I thought, man, I know my, I have a buddy with a, f with a brother who is schizophrenic and mm -hmm. makes life hard and it's always his brother. And, and I, I you, you get... The yep. question I'm implying sure. here. So I just want you to respond to that a little bit because I've I've been nervous since then about using the language of family within the kind of team building uh, process. Yeah, it's it's funny as you read that I got jealous because <laughs> I actually am a manager in the world of the union. Oh right. So yeah. I don't. You can't ask <laughs> can't, them to leave. No, and I. Hmm. When I get assigned to school, I get assigned the people. And hmm. so there is no freedom to decide who's family and who's not. And you are not you. I am not. I cannot be. Why is that? Um, just the position. Okay. So All right. I fall technically under the principal. So he or she can decide my fates, but there has to be documentation with that. Um, I'm simply put, I'm less protected, but I'm also hired wage right and I have more responsibilities yep. um and it's just weird because we're kind of an autonomous thing like we're a, we're each individual businesses at our own school but we're under one department yep okay. um but yeah well <laughs> as you read that I got very jealous because I I operate as if we are a family and in the current school that I'm at um three quarters of them are mainly Spanish speaking mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of like issues there where I have to translate and there's different, each of them are from a different country. So. Oh, so the that, inner, inner country. Yeah. Conflict. Um, yep. And like, yeah, God forbid you pair the person from Honduras with the person from the Dominican because right. they're not going to wash dishes together or whatever. So I have to navigate that. Um, but a lot of the time when, when we've had conflict, which was often, um, it started to get better as summer was approaching. I think they just had an, a goal in sight. Um, they're all at least 20 to 30 years my senior as well. So I'm one of the youngest managers in the district that has its own issues, right? Um, but I told them early on that I was committed to them and I let them assess me and I would ask them, you know, what have I done well today? What would you prefer I did? Now, granted, I'm not always going to do what they say, but I've created a space for them to speak freely. And during all of our staff meetings, I often brought up the fact that this is just like a family where you didn't choose it, right? Um, I mean, you can choose who you're going to marry, right? But you don't choose your siblings and your parents and your right. cousins and stuff. So I was like, listen, we're all here. Um, we have to be a family. There's 10 of us and there's 900 kids. Like we have to work together or we don't feed the kids and then we don't have jobs right so there was a uh, it wasn't the first meeting we had but it was a, the second meeting um where there was conflict with um two specific people a man and a woman I have two men in the kitchen the rest are women and it got to the point where I was like listen I know we're in one large kitchen and we don't necessarily have rooms that you can go into I was like but you have to consider this man your brother and you have to consider this woman your sister 
and there's going to be days you probably shouldn't talk to get like talk to each other, right? You get under under each other's skin. I was like, but you have to maintain some sort of baseline. And for whatever reason that worked. So they don't interact often. They typically remain on opposite sides of the kitchen, but the family model in describing that seemed to connect with them. Yeah. Now, I don't know I don't tap into their personal lives unless they freely tell me. So I, I know very little about those two specific people. They're a little bit, um, they, have, they have walls around them. Um, good employees, though, that's the thing. So they're both very good at what they do, and they just happen to dislike each other. But it was helpful in when it came to, like, conflict resolution to use the term family. And I think it was because we didn't choose each other. Mm. And if, if one of them needs to be fired... There is a very long process that that entails, and it includes multiple levels of documentation and meetings and career observation. Like, I don't have the freedom to just say, hey, you're being a huge dick today, and you need to leave. So, yeah. Now, my question, I guess, was, you know, assuming that you could, right? Mm -hmm. So in any other setting, basically, you are like... Be, be, the, the system you're describing is you're you're there's like it's systematically made to not fire it protects and so them, you're yeah. yeah so it is like built to be like okay you want out of this family right then you're gonna go through hell to do it right yeah. like you yeah it's almost like getting you're getting a divorce or right. you gotta have whatever it's like you you need to go through all this process yep. because of the union there's a million things that would frustrate me about that, I imagine. And oh, yet yeah. there might be a benefit to that as well. I don't mm -hmm. know. But I don't, I'm not jealous of your position managing right. people you can't fire. Mm -hmm. Because I also, on the other side, go, if you know someone is toxic to the team, you need to cut them yesterday, if right. possible, right? And so, so okay, but that aside, so so you're jealous in the reading of that. Maybe yeah, jealous sorry, of others I, who I'm, can manage their team. Yeah. But like you've been in other settings, I guess I, I just want you to speak to the idea of family, mm -hmm. I, I, assuming some freedom to lead and to cut. And sure. To, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If, yeah, if I remove myself from my current situation, I am heavily supportive of boundaries, both personally and relationally. Mm -hmm. um, and if I had more freedom with my employees, I would be very much honing in on their behavior and the words they use and less on their actual work. So I think that a lot of the tasks that we do in the kitchen can be taught. I think there are specific people that do them better, right? And it's they either devote more time to it or they're just more naturally talented in that area. But I do believe that most people can be taught and should be taught how to feed themselves and other people. Um, and I think... If that is the baseline, it's like, okay, you need to feed these people. Okay, get that done. But what I really care about is how you interact with your coworkers and how you interact with the kids that you're serving. So if they weren't in the union, I think, um, I mean, most of them from others. I've been to school. I believe this is my fifth school in the past, like, six years, um, which sounds bad, but I was moved around um, in hopes of like fixing different problems because you do a good job. I do. Yeah, I do a good job. I don't do a great job. I've learned a lot over the years and I probably sell myself short, but, um, the biggest hurdle is relationship. Like it doesn't even matter what you're doing. Like it, even if everybody did their job and all the kids got fed and there weren't any leftovers, if they were screaming at each other all day, it was a miserable experience, right? Mm. So for me as a manager, managing people, which you can't do, mm -hmm. um, you can't manage people and you can't manage their behaviors, but you can set boundaries and rules, right? So it's like you break those rules or you hurt another person verbally, physically, whatever, then that's going to expedite the process. Like even the union doesn't put up with that, right? But there is a many hoops to jump through. Um, so I think if I didn't have that cloud hanging over me, I would expect that people interacted with each other like a family and they had grace. Cause I know that 
you love your family and then some days you just don't want to be around them. Like something happens, right? I mean, it's, it, you, you need space. And I know that at work, you don't usually get space, right? So it's a hard model because you're telling these people you need to be a family, but for eight hours, you are right here. You are shoulder to shoulder with these people. So it's like a specific type of family. It's a family that has less freedom than your actual family. So say you do get an argument with your family at home, you guys can go to another room or you can, you know, hop in the car and go to the park, right? You cannot do that at work. So when I use the term family with my staff, I hone in on how do you want to be treated? (laughs) How do you want to be seen? by others, by the kids. I was like, the kids are watching you like hawks, right? They come in, especially the little ones. They watch us, how we interact with each other. They watch us talk to other kids. And so what I've always told them, I was like, listen, I know that you guys wouldn't hang out with each other. There's a couple that would. I know you wouldn't hang out with each other, but just know that here's the job we need to do and here's what's expected of you. And for whatever reason... When you speak to people and you give them the analogy of like a camera, I told them, I said, if, how would you feel if you got to watch a film of the interaction you just had with your coworker? They go, oh, I don't want to watch that. Right. So you probably shouldn't act that way. Um, and, and this is kind of going all over the place, but it's just I'm realizing that I still believe that a staff should be viewed as a family Mm. I think it's important Um, and I think sure there are people in your family that you may need to cut out um, but it's going to typically be around their behavior right Mm -hmm. not like whether they can get a job done or they're good at what they do like the the severance is going to be behavior right you know that's probably most likely true I, I mean they're Sure, there are positions that if you just don't perform, you could be a sweetheart. Sure. You need yeah, to go. Yeah, absolutely. You can just go do, you can go clean something mm-hmm. or do something different. But, yeah. You know, there are jobs that mandate performance for right. sure, right? Yep. Yeah. But, but you're right. I mean, yeah, you, on the flip side of that, you could have a top performer that's a dick. Yeah. That needs to go because everyone else will be better off. Without that person. And I guess, I don't know, just talk. And it's to harder this. to get rid of that person because they're a top performer. That's right. Oh, yeah. You would make every excuse in the world not to get rid of someone who's producing. Right. And a lot of companies and a lot of teams, I think, do that. You know, keep a lo- keep. Uh, there's actually a really cool. I might even have it here somewhere. Um, I do. Actually, that's so funny. I just print this out the other day. Um This is from Richard Beck. uh, So uh, it should not be so among you. Um, Social psychological reflections on anarchism and the principalities and powers. So from so anarchism and principalities and powers is a reference from the Bible um, and uh, reflection done by Walter Wink. So this is a lot of Walter Wink's work on that and anarchism. Um, he said to start this paper to start, this paper was originally entitled on anarchism and assholes, the powers that be here, uh, at the, the powers that be here at the Christian scholars conference found that title a bit too provocative. They requested a change and we accommodated them. My feeling is that this is as it should be a session on anarchism has to have some confrontation with principalities and powers. The Assholes from the original title was a reference to the best-selling, award-winning business book, The No Asshole Rule, Building a Civilized Workplace and Surviving One That Isn't. Interesting book, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah, very much so. But that's kind of what I hear you talking about is like there needs to be a no asshole rule and I don't care how much you're performing. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because you, I mean, you wouldn't, if you think of it in a way of having like a, a brother who's an addict you're not going to consent to that for your brother's life, right? You're at some point you're going to say, Hey, you know, you're, you're being an asshole. If you change your behavior, this is going to be so much better, right? I love you, but I hate your behavior. Yeah. Right. And then it sucks if it's your brother, but it's like there, it's always going to come down to behavior in, in, in my experience when it Mm -hmm. comes to work. 
Um, and often the assholes are pretty good at what they do. And I think it's because, like, they usually, in order to be an asshole, you need to have at least a baseline knowledge that you're good at what you do or you really shouldn't open your mouth, right? Like, there's some pride there already. Um, and it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. This is helpful to talk through, even in my question about the, my own reluctance to use family terminology, because I guess ultimately we're saying, you know, it's, it's similar. It's like, like part of the reason for that thing we hung on the wall about, you know, the two stout brothers escorting them, escorting them out was really our commitment was to hospitality and inclusion. So we were like, we want to be inclusive, meaning if someone comes to the door, we want to be able to say, you're welcome here. Welcome home. You can Mm -hmm. come on in. That was kind of a radical commitment to hospitality that we had. And what we realized is if you want to be inclusive, you have to be exclusive, meaning there is one person that needs to be excluded. And it's the person that makes it unsafe for the for someone else here. Right. So and there were times where we'd walk into the family room and see like, I don't know, a woman that lived on the streets napping on an ottoman in the middle of a room full of men on the streets that she was safe. And maybe that wouldn't have been the case in another environment, Mm -hmm. but she could sleep peacefully in this place. And it was because we were there and the place had a certain spirit to it. But then also we were quick to, and so were actually the visitors and guests were quick to dismiss anyone who was bringing, let's say in the way, a lot of times it was like the drama from the street into the family room. Mm -hmm. And there really was a temperature change, not just because of the AC, but like spiritually, like when you went outside on the street and inside in there, there was a bit of an oasis and graceful spirit about the place. Um, but, but at the heart of it, it did say, Hey, you need to exclude someone. And that would, that could be true in a family as well. If you have an addict that's ruining the family Mm -hmm. better to put them out than allow the whole family to be sick. I mean, that's why we have things like Al-Anon for yeah. family of alcoholics. Cause it's like, if you keep trying to clean up after your alcoholic son or brother or father, or you keep trying to, sh- you know, hide all their alcohol or control their b- behavior, what's going to happen is you become mentally ill mm-hmm. and you be, you need a 12 step recovery program rather than now, now you're both ill. Now you're right. both need recovery rather than just having cut out the, the illness that is the individual, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's really helpful. Um, so I want to ask you, I want to change this a little bit. I want to ask you um, about a experience. So you're familiar, I'm sure, I already know this, but I want to ask for the sake of the conversation here <laughs> being recorded. You're familiar with the experience of locking into a task, losing track of time, being super focused on that task, kind of forgetting to eat, yep. you know, feeling very productive and quick you, you, mm-hmm. you know that experience um can you tell me about maybe something that give me an example of that experience for you um like flow state is that yeah that's exactly okay. what i'm yeah. describing yeah um <laughs> it's gonna sound so funny i love organizing okay and we and it, i specifically love organizing food on shelves mm-hmm. and, and you've done so good i love it and we um, at the site that I'm at right now, um, the, my staff is a lot older, so that, so they're naturally more mature. Um, the site that I came from prior to that had a various amount of ages. Um, and I did a lot more at that site because I just felt like I wanted to or whatever. And I, I used to unload the truck at that school and we would get a weekly delivery from our distributor multiple vendors, but our main vendor would come in and it would take two hours to like, just get all these things out of the boxes, put them on the shelves. And I remember, um, doing that every Wednesday. And for whatever reason, Wednesdays were the quickest day of the week for me. And I would go in, like the truck would drop off the stuff at eight and I would just be putting stuff on the shelves, dating and labeling it. All of a sudden it's 1130. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, whoa, that was crazy. Now, it that wasn't me actually creating something, but it was me doing work, right? Yeah. Um, I've had that experience with writing, like memoirs. I've just, and same with reading, reading and writing. I've gone into some sort of state of mind and then just plowed through material or whatever. But yeah, in regards to work, um, 
organizing is that's interesting it, why do you I, think that is i don't know i think that um i'm naturally neurotic and i think organizing is using that trait in a positive manner right well wouldn't that be like being orderly conscientious maybe but I'm being neurotic it bothers you it but it does so like not to the point where th- everything needs to face the same way but like the black beans should be with the black beans like it's Obviously. it shouldn't be over here with the kidney beans you know so i <laughs> but they're all beans right so they should all go together um yeah i think there's a there's the neurotic side of me that wants it to be done the way i want it done and there's the orderly side of me that wants it to be easily accessible and clear right and clean mm-hmm. um and then there's, I just really love food. So I love like looking at food and reading the labels. I'm very odd, but it, for whatever reason, yeah, putting things on the shelves, I enter into some sort of flow state and I get it done quicker than any other person I've ever worked with. And I've had staff just go, you know, let's just let Erica do the truck because I'll get it done faster than you. I'm going to actually enjoy it. It's going to be clean. And I'm not saying I'm better than these people. It's just this p- particular task, I enter into some sort of state of mind. And it's to that. It, I think a big thing is s- completing that, stepping back and looking at it. I know with us, I, I've, I've rearranged the pantry a ton of times. I've rearranged the kitchen over at Waters. I have a ton of time. And I always send you a picture. You always take a picture. Always. I'm just like, look at it. Look at it. It's all clean and the colors are together and I just feel good. And for whatever reason, that day goes by faster. Those hours feel like minutes. It's odd. Yeah. And isn't it such an awesome state to enter into? Yes. And I I think that there's so much to learn from that. I'm so fascinated with flow in general Mm -hmm. because I do think it... It's something like finding work that you find that usually you have a sense of purpose in. Yep. Usually there's some sense of challenge uh, related to it. And there's there, you know, but you like it like an overlap of a use of your capacity with uh, purpose. Mm -hmm. And and it's just I don't know. And you use the word enjoyable, but it's like, yeah, it's it's glorious. It's such a glorious experience. Uh, You know, they a lot of folks because of time dilation, meaning like we lose track of time. Uh, we'll call it like the deep now. Mm-hmm. And I love that because I, you know, in theological language, there's an idea of like the eternal now that, that this is somehow like we are like eternity is now we are part of that. And, right. and that experience to me, uh, I go, man, I think that is like a taste of something like, you know, meaningful, purposeful work that is that is it's it's like a taste of eternal life in a mm-hmm. way, like in that moment. And it's just so interesting that it could be something from, you know, doing writing something or, you know, stocking shelves. Yeah. I, I actually have the same experience. I was a night stock um, boy at uh, a grocery store mm-hmm. overnight for years. And it's still one of my favorite jobs. I love stocking shelves. Johnny like, Produce. That's actually where Johnny yeah. Produce comes from. That's yep. right. I had the produce department for a while and Johnny on my name tag. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I don't think many people know where that comes from. <laughs> it still sticks around because I made it my email. Well, um, it, go ahead. It's interesting to me because th- the way that my career has evolved, I'm probably going to be in a managerial role, right, for the rest of my life if I choose to stay in this arena. Yeah. Um, but if I had to choose, I would be a prep cook. I I love having a list in front of me, having various tasks to complete and do just basically a prep cook is like here chop these things up and put it in this Mm -hmm. pan chop chop these things up put in this pan and for whatever reason that was the most therapeutic meditative job i've ever had and it's unfortunately a very low-paying job um but i adored it i loved it and that i every time i um went to work and I was the prep cook. It, the day went by so fast and I just loved it. So that was, that's definitely another flow state activity for me. I've always found personally that work that was super monotonous and like physical. So like, um, and repetitive, like usually. I, like I worked produce, giant yep. produce. Right. And so I wrapped grapes. Yeah. 
right? You take some grapes out of a case, you put a certain amount on a scale, Mm -hmm. put them on that styrofoam thing and you wrap them in plastic. Uh, and you wrap other things, obviously, you know, whatever the, whatever else we wrapped, did the same thing in the meat department, wrapping produce and meat. I thought was like the greatest thing I'd ever done. Now I love stocking shelves, but one of the things for me that was so great about it is my mind was liberated. So it was like my body was engaged in this task that didn't take a lot of my mind. Like I could do it great Mm -hmm. and fast without thought, Yeah, which made my mind available to me to write and dream and think or mm-hmm. you know I wasn't li- you know, I didn't have the like now it would be like just rock and podcasts all the sure, time but yeah. like it you know which at least feels like learning and I think in some ways is mm-hmm. I'm learning quite a bit through conversations I've been listening to and even been inspired to start conversations like this yep. with um around topics like this and so but for me that's been a deep experience where it's like if my mind is set free so I'd always have like a notepad next to me to scribble down ideas that came to me while Mm -hmm. I was wrapping the grapes or the steaks or whatever yeah there was a dude that um I worked next to his name was Antonio so when I was the prep cook he was actually cutting all the meat weighing the the lunch meat cutting the fish um and he'd been there at least 10 years by the time I got there um but this man didn't use a scale And that was my first experience of like an artist. And so he, now hear me out. He would grab with his glove a like bunch of lunch meat, put in a bag, two ounces, grab another bunch, put in a bag, he put in a three ounce bag. And I was at (laughs) my first day, I was like, this dude is just doing whatever the heck he wants to do. He doesn't give a shit, right? That's what it sounds like. Yeah. No. So if you grab one of those bags, throw it on the scale, it's two ounces. If you grab the three ounce bag, put it on a scale, it's three ounces. That's insane. And if it was off, it was off by... I couldn't tell you if a weight was three pounds or five pounds. He knew. And he'd been doing this so long. And he was always... His station looked the same every day. And it was funny because like, there's a term in restaurants and we run out of something. It's, it's 86, right? Oh, so, this is the 86th yeah, Antonio? Yeah. So <laughs> he, would, he would do that. He wouldn't talk to anybody. Like he would maybe like throw some jokes around or whatever. He'd call back like herd to the chefs. But when he was done, every day he'd go, 86 Antonio. And he'd clean up his station and he'd go home. And it was amazing. Like I, he was also from Brazil. So he, there was a language barrier there, but... The dude was incredible, and you could tell that he enjoyed it. And he was tired at the end of the day. He was on his feet for eight, nine hours, right? He stood on a mat, um, and he the only time he moved from his station was to go get more meat or to put the meat that he'd portioned into the cooler. And he was incredible. It was it was like watching an artist. It felt like watching somebody on chef's table. Yeah. And it was monotonous. It was the same. Nothing about his job differed in any way shape or form from the previous day to the next day he had the same list every day he may like based on supply and demand have a different cut of meat that he needed more of that day but it was generally the same Mm -hmm. and that dude did that five or six days a week and he was on point and it was always good and he was just funny and he just one about his yeah it's that's antonio so some stories that you've told like the themes that have come up i i so i just you know you taking, sending me a picture at the end of organizing the shelves or whatever, which I always get a lot of joy out of. I <laughs> love seeing the product of that. I knew that you enjoyed doing it. I knew yeah. that our guests and neighbors are going to be better served because you did it. Our volunteers are going to be more organized because you did it. But just the experience of like finishing a job and going, oh, look at that thing I did. Mm-hmm. Whether it was bagging meat or stocking shelves or wrapping meat or mm-hmm. whatever the task at hand was. I know for me, I used to lay tile and this was an experience laying tile. But to stand back at the end of a day's work, maybe you were in the flow state, maybe you weren't. Mm-hmm. But to go, I, I worked hard. I accomplished this task and I did that. And yeah, and you said, so the other thing you said was like, oh, yeah, he finished the day 86 Antonio. I mean, he's obviously tired. Right. But he was good. Yep. And. I, I'm curious like about a couple things like um, I want you to kind of, I don't know, reflect on or speak to that, that sense of fulfillment for doing a thing worth doing and doing it well. Mm-hmm. And then, and then maybe because of the tiredness that comes with that, the role of rest for you. 
Sure. Um, well, I know with the different times I've felt like I was in a flow state, um, in a restaurant or in the school, um, a huge part of the joy at the end of the task was knowing that I contributed to the greater thing that was happening. Mm. So if I'm stocking shelves, I know that my employees aren't going to spend an extra 15 minutes in the dry storage looking for that thing. They're going to be able to go in and grab it and complete the day. And I assume that was similar to Antonio. Antonio never worked the line, but if none of that meat was cut, portioned and prepped, we wouldn't have a restaurant. Right. Right. So, I think knowing that you've contributed to something bigger than yourself is probably an element to that satisfaction that you feel at the end. So even if you lay tile at a, like a business, you know that those people are going to stand on that tile every day. And it's going to be a part of their life. Same with you. If you do tile at a family home, yep. it's like, you're going to step back and go, damn, that looks good. Mm -hmm. And then also knowing this family is going to get to, reap the rewards of my work, right? Yep. And their their bathroom's going to be cleaner, whatever have you. So I think part of that satisfaction is knowing that what you did had purpose. It matters. It matters, yeah. Yeah, that's good. And then, um, yeah, rest. If you, I won't say if you, I know that I feel the most at peace when I have worked hard. Yeah. And I believe that the work was good and I feel secure um, knowing that I'll get to do the work again. So I think for me, it just like most people in America work Monday through Friday. I also work Monday through Friday. Um, so the weekend is supposed to be rest. And I, if, if whatever I did the week before I knew that I did half-assed or I didn't complete any tasks. I wasn't really able to rest. Mm. It was like just more anxiety. Restlessness. It was restlessness, anxiety, yeah. yeah. So if I had had a good week, I did everything I was supposed to do. Um, relationally, we all vibed in the kitchen. The kids were fed. I experienced a different kind of rest. Th does that make sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. It, um, now, so to have true rest there is also a requirement that you do good work, right? So like, I I wonder if I would feel the same type of rest if I did a half-assed job. It's like, you, if you cram for yeah. uh, the deadline of an essay, like, and you do it the night before, and then you're like, oh, good, I get to rest today. Well, I'm sure that if you had done the essay two weeks ago and had that two weeks to proofread and perfect it, that day that you turn in the essay is probably a different type of rest, right? Cause you feel good about the work. You know that you tried your hardest. You, does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. I mean, there's something to be said for doing a good job, doing yeah. your best at something, not, um, and, and, and I think what you're saying and what I hear you saying and what I agree with is that rest is a byproduct of work. Yes. Like that rest grows out of work and that without work, there is only restlessness. Right. And, 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 and interestingly, that seems related to the idea of purpose. Mm -hmm. Like without purpose, there is restlessness. So, so many of the folks that I know that I've spoken with that hate their job. Well, a couple things. One is they often leave their job and go do meaningful work and mm -hmm. don't associate it. If I ask them what they, <laughs> I ask them about work. They talk about their job while they do meaningful work outside sure. of that. And that that's a sad situation to me a little bit in mm -hmm. the way those have been alienated from each other. But then also there is just a sense of purposelessness. Someone says, you know, yeah, I go in and no matter how hard I work, uh, it doesn't matter. Right. There's no point. Um, I could have not shown up or I could have just, you know, whatever. Yeah. Hopefully that's not true of most people's job. I mean, even, you know, I even think like, it would be fulfilling to be a garbage man. Mm -hmm. But it's like, yeah, there's a bunch of trash and people would really like that to go away. It's actually <laughs> really bad if it piles up. It's unhealthy for all of society mm -hmm. and society will function like the dishwasher, yeah. right? It's like the things that we maybe least want to do or value in some sense are the most valuable uh, person to be and place to be. And, sure. Um, now, you know, and it, it I, breaks my heart when I hear people talk about hating yeah work. oh for sure because it's such a huge amount of time 
Uh, so you're spending the majority of your life doing majority this. Majority of your life. And I actually believe you were created to work. Sure. And like this is like like you need this as much as you need to eat. Yep. And so you're gonna die if you stay in that space. And Absolutely. so I would say you'll quit your job. And of course, I actually think I you know, we had a conversation like this at one point when you were in a different situation Absolutely. with work and you didn't want to be there. And I was like, quit yesterday. Yep. And people generally respond with what? Fear and anxiety. But I need security the security of a paycheck and i'm like yeah it you know be better to let some of those things fall by the wayside i mean obviously be be smart people and this right? will come down to temperament too. and it will come down yeah. to temperament right yeah i would temperamentally take a risk sure just for the sake of purpose well and it makes me so i know that for me because i'm able to rest because i know that i have a job so, oh yeah. If there so, was nowhere to go on Monday. Yeah. So I do, I wonder like if you were, I don't know if you know anybody, but to sp- ask that question to a day laborer, right? Yeah. To somebody who has to like not beg, but hope that work is given to him or her that day and then yeah. repeat that process the next day. So like, I wonder if people are able to rest, even if they're doing good work, And there's no security, like a security part of that rest. Well, that's interesting. I do. I imagine that you're, you're zeroing in on something that's temperamental. Sure. And I would hope that for people, you know, that good work produces the good fruit of rest. Mm -hmm. And then there is a sense of trust that a good worker will have work to do. Um, Now it's funny because we look at the future and things that are coming. It's like, there's a lot of jobs that are not going to be available anymore. Like there are not going to be drivers. They're not like, they're not going to be cashiers. There's, Mm -hmm. you know, there's so many things that. I mean, shoot, even a lot of the restaurant stuff, I mean, we'll see, but a lot, there just is so many things that can be automated and replaced. And so there'll be a lot less jobs. And I actually think it's really urgent that people find a way to rethink work and Mm -hmm. the meaning of work because they're not going to have jobs. Right. And, and it's going to be, it's going to be a serious problem, but sorry, I just tangented. No, it's fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, and for me the my, my job meets a basic need. So it has like an inherent security to it. So if I like people who are in clothing and food yeah, yeah, and yeah. shelter, you know, if your job, um, there's a meets, necessity. Yeah. Of that. So the secure, Oh, Oh, that's what I was saying. So right. The temperamental piece of what you're saying, like the, like I would hope that the day laborer could have some sense of almost like faith. Like, yeah, it'll be good tomorrow. But the, on the flip side of that, yeah, I could imagine if you didn't know you had a job next week. So beyond the day labor, what I think of is like, you know, oh, I, and I know a lot of people that do this, especially artists that you can talk to them about how much they got paid for a day's work. And it's like, God, you got paid that much for yeah. one day there. Uh, yeah. And hopefully I get another contract next month, right. like, because I got a gig. Right. Yeah. And there is a gig economy. Sure. Emerging, I took which part I in think, that for yeah. a minute. Yeah. Oh, tell me about that. Yeah. I did uh, DoorDash and I did Postmates and I did it to kind of supplement my income. Um, and you were also trying to warm up to quit. Yeah. I was, which, yeah. <laughs> You're like, Could this work? Right. So that when I was doing DoorDash and Postmates, I was still in student nutrition, but I was in an office job and I wasn't around food and I wasn't around kids. And I quickly realized that. I want that, right? Food and kids. Food and kids, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I understand it. I know it well and whatever, I enjoy it. Um, so yeah, I was pursuing like gig, the gig economy and I did DoorDash and Postmates for a while and it it became abundantly clear that it it's funny because like, in order to deliver the food, I needed to use my car and then I needed to fill my tank and show, sure, I'm making money and I'm making tips or whatever, but it, for me, it quickly, I was just in the red the whole time, right? So like I would get a call I would, or I would accept a call on the phone and you, for depending on the company, you can tell where it is and there's all these rules and regulations to like accepting and denying orders. I would accept something. Okay, it's 20 minutes away. I go to that place. That person ordered French fries. Great. And now I drive 20 minutes back to deliver the French fries. So like that person didn't tip. Cool. I used $10 in gas and I got $7.50 for mm-hmm. the French fries as a trip. So my experience of the gig economy was 
it to me it had to be in addition to. So there are people who have devoted their lives to this. Yeah. And it's to me it was very risky. You'd there's, be stressed. Oh man, there's no benefits, right? I mean it's you're a Yeah, contract ten ninety nine, yeah. yeah. Self employed. So I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the process, um, but I did, it was slightly degrading, I think too, <laughs> which like I would go and grab a Subway sub for like this super duper rich guy and deliver it to him. And I'm like, it Subway was two doors over from his building, mm -hmm. but he did DoorDash. And I'd be like, here's your sub, man. You know, so my experience was weird. Um, Tampa is so spread out too. Like this, it it's just not a fun place to do gig economy. But yeah, people are pursuing that as a full time occupation. Yeah, some are doing great. Yeah, and I I think you temperamentally have to not need security like I do. Well, right. right. So I think and, and temperament. I think there's something to that because that's that would also be like for me. I am not. I, I could do it. Sure. And, and I think that's also partly why I'm good entrepreneurially. Like well, it's, it's a great job. It's autonomous. You control your day. Yeah. Like there's a lot of pros, but the I cons want. are very clear to me. And it's like about security, right? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I want to ask you what might be a final question unless you want to dig into sure. some other stuff. Um, it's a question I've been trying to ask people in general, and I think I think I'll, it'll be a feature of these interviews. Um, what is success? <laughs> um, what is success? Now, like I said before, um, this is going to be a feelings answer. Bring it. Um, success to me has always felt like satisfaction um, and it man I don't I don't know it's a hard I don't think I can define it in one sentence um, it doesn't I've, have to I, be one sentence okay. you can just talk I more I more experience it um, and I've talked to you about this before too and uh, for me like just an example of success um, is integrating communities so a lot of the people that work for me make a very low wage and thus need extra support. And so one of the guys in the kitchen um, had told, he had, he had alluded to the fact that they don't have a lot of money and do I know anybody who could potentially have a car? Do I know anybody who has like food stamps or anything like that? And so what I did was I told him, I said, hey, we have a free market every Monday. Just come by and grab some food. And he was like, he was hesitant at first. Um, he didn't come that first week. Mm -hmm. He came the second week and he came with his wife and, um, they grabbed, you know, a bunch of groceries. They have like a little baby that lives with them, their granddaughter and a, um, their daughter and the boyfriend, I believe. And it's a big household and with a small income. Right. And it was so simple. I mean, he come, he comes at, less now but his wife comes every single week yeah and to yep. me that feels like success i feel satisfied and i know that um it's so simple and it's not really like this remarkable story of it's beautiful though. but it yeah it, f it just feels right it feels good and i know these are like just these aren't elaborate words good and right no but well they're the deepest words really. yeah, yeah and it's good right true like there a, a need was voiced i have a resource i met the need with that resource and thus like strengthen the bond that we have relationally as employee and employer and now his family is grateful and it's just it was like a domino effect of just positivity and i think that it would be hard to remove positivity from success. So like mm -hmm. it, if what you do creates a ripple effect of negativity, I wouldn't necessarily view that as successful. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so part of this was like the end result was positive. It met a need and it strengthened a relationship. It just feels like success. And I'm satisfied in the fact that we were able to do that. No, that is, that's a very good answer. I dig it. Um, 
Is there anything you'd like to add for people listening? Anything you want to say before we wrap it up? No, I think I'm good. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, one, I love you. I love Thank you, you too. so much for <laughs> spending this time with me and being part of this project. And uh, I'm looking forward to many more conversations with you and then many more conversations with folks on the show to talk through their own relationship to work. For sure. Awesome.